Hey everybody, Jim the Tabletop Engineer here and welcome to a new episode. I got an email recently from a viewer named Mark who asked if I would consider creating a video showing some of the basic uses and techniques with the Proxon foam cutter. Now at first I was a little hesitant because, you know, it's a cutter. You, you turn it on, you set the temperature and you run your foam through and it cuts. But as I thought about it more and more, I realized that there are a lot of things that I do regularly with this tool that were not explained to me in a manual. In this video, I'm going to tackle this for you, Mark, um, and for anyone else who is getting a Proxon or considering getting a Proxon. Uh, I want to show you just some of the basic things you need to understand about this tool so that you can get a jump start and start producing some really cool stuff with it. Uh, I hope that by the end of this video, you have a better idea and understanding of, of some of the basic techniques of using it. It's not a hard machine to use, but you just, as you use it more and more, you're going to get more familiar with uh, things like speed and temperature and stuff like that. So take a look, and if you have any more questions, please post them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. But uh, let's get to the tabletop and see how this thing works. All right, let's take a look at this. Uh, it's not plugged in right now because I want to move it around and show you a few things. The technical term for this is the Proxon Thermocut. It's sold by a company called Proxon. They have a lot of different tools, but this, in, in our line of work, in the crafting hobby, this seems to be the one that everybody eventually uh, gets who is going to be doing a lot of uh, crafting and foam cutting. It's a, it's a pretty simple device. This is called the fence, this uh, piece. I think it's just aluminum. And it mounts on this uh, guide right here that moves left and right. You can also fit it up in this groove so it moves front to back. It also can be set for angle cuts, which I'll demonstrate uh, later in this video. So you have two knobs. This knob tightens the horizontal movement or vertical movement, depending on just by cranking it down. And then this loosens and allows you to adjust the angle here. And it's marked on the actual uh, gold piece here, the angle. So you try to set it at close to zero as you can. Um, not super accurate, but close enough. And then what you lack in accuracy, you can use vis visually with your eyes because there is a grid system on here. Each one of these squares is one centimeter uh, in width and height. So uh, that can help. Uh, it's metric. <laughs> uh, there are times when I really, really wish this were in uh, inches, but that's okay, or quarter inches, or had marks for um, eighth of an inch. Even down to eighth of an inch would be nice. But um, this is what it is. On the front here, uh, you have, um, have the on-off switch. This sets your temperature. This right here is a, it loosens and tightens, and it holds this uh, wire that gets really hot. Can you hear it? Uh, it tightens and loosens the wire. Uh, this wire will occasionally break, and when it does, you pull out the piece that's sticking out here, and you loosen the knob, and then you feed the wire down in and tighten it up. And uh, it, uh, you know, this this basically holds it. And then you, <laughs> then you have this uh, really high tech gauge here, which I'll be—I'm joking. It's—it's it's not. It—it it definitely talks about the thickness in millimeters of your material, and what the what to set the uh, the temperature gauge to one through six. And I'll be honest, I never even look at this. Um, when I start showing you how to make your cuts, I'll explain the use of the temperature dial and when you might want to crank it up and when you might want to crank it down. Last few things, up top here uh, you have this rail that goes all the way around and down underneath. This thing basically makes a circuit. So when you turn on the electricity, electricity is flowing through and it heats up the wire. So when the wire breaks, the machine is dead. It will not, it will not work. You turn it off, fix the wire, and you're back in business. The, uh, the gauge, there's a, there's a dial back here which when you loosen, you really have to loosen both in order to move this along the arm. As you move this back, this right here tightens it so it, so it won't slide anymore. And of course this has to be loosened because you have a small spool of the wire here on top. As you move it this way, what you're doing is you're angling the wire. And this is used to make what we call bevel cuts. And 
you can you can do it visually or you can do it with a protractor so you can get the uh, the angle and you have to loosen this because as this moves back uh, you need more wire for the distance here but you may notice a, a mark right here uh, normally what you do is you take a, uh, a compass and you you put it behind the wire to, to get it vertically at 90 degrees well I've done this enough that I made a, a mark that I can quickly quickly uh, move my uh, the slider up to and I place it just right on the line tighten it down and when I do that I know that I have a 90 degree wire see here how it's not making any sound it's very loose see the wire how, mo how it moves what you do here is you just tighten this up and you tighten the top lever down here hear how it's like a guitar string right now you're gonna learn over time that you can you can tighten this too much tighten it too much and it will break what I like I like a good to me that's still too loose so what I do is I loosen this up just a little I press down on this arm alright I press down and then tighten I'm, I'm turning uh, clockwise on the spool to take in the wire and then I tighten it and then when I let up the arm goes back up and it puts even more tension on the wire you can do this you can put too much tension on this wire you'll learn you'll learn as you use your tool the right amount of tension for the right amount of speed that you're going to be pushing a piece of foam through alright the only other thing you probably need to understand is when you get your prox on it's going to come unassembled and follow the instructions carefully I don't really have uh, a lot to say here this wire I believe will be uh, unattached so you'll you'll have to screw it into here to form the connection and you can see this is the piece I don't even know if you'll be able to see this but there is a little bit of wire poking out right here so you're feeding that down into that hole a little more than an inch some people don't go that far but I do see this see this uh, bar right here that is the the the, the uh, tightening knob right here what I it, I don't tighten it until I can see a little bit of the wire coming out down here and then my final bit of advice before you plug this in and get started is every time every time you plan on using the proxon give the, uh, the the tightener here for the wire just give it a crank it, it loosens up over time because of vibrations and it's a screw it's a mechanical object so uh, over time it just it loosens the tension comes off so before you start you know start using it just give it a good twist make sure it's tight and holding that wire in all right I have a very uh, small piece of foam here uh, let's see if I can measure it because I want to demonstrate the temperature and how it melts the foam all right if you can look this is pretty much one inch it's just shy of one inch the reason I'm showing you that is the temperature uh, gauge up here has a lot of different functions one if you set it really high and you you increase it by turning it clockwise and you decrease it by counterclockwise let's turn it all the way up when you run a piece of foam through the wire that it's at a high temperature setting the wire is actually going to melt some of the foam all right so we know this is one inch approximately and I'm gonna try to cut it in half and I'm just I'm not doing it accurate I'm just visually lining the wire up with sort of the halfway point and when you turn it on uh, I'm gonna run it through at a at a moderate speed moderate is just I don't really know how to explain the feed speed but watch I'm just gonna run it through at a moderate speed all right now if I put these two pieces together that gap it's not it's not big it's not big at all but if I measure it I can tell you it lost it lost just a little bit it's kinda of hard to tell with my my measurement tool here you just have to trust me on this it lost a little bit of material so that when these are put together they're not quite the same width the one inch that it was before I cut it that's because at the high temperature it's removing a lot more of the material now you look at that and you say that's that's just not that big of a loss but 
let's say I had 20 of these going out and they're going to be glued, glued, glued. If I'm losing a 32nd of an inch uh, in material and I glue 32 of these together, 32 of these, these size pieces, I'm going to lose over time, right, I'm losing 1 32nd of an inch. After 32 of these, I will have lost an entire inch of length, right? Does that make sense? If, e if each time I'm losing just 1 32nd material, over time that cu accumulates. It becomes cumulative. So you will end up uh, you'll end up with something that you wanted to be, say, 10 inches, and it might be 9 and 3 quarters. And you'll scratch your head going, I made all my measurements correct. Why, why isn't it 10 inches? It's because you didn't take into account that you're losing material when you cut it. Now, let me turn the temperature down a little bit to one of its low settings. Let's measure this. It's 1 and 7 eighths. One thing I should tell you, at a high temperature, you can feed the material through very quickly without putting a lot of tension on the wire and breaking it. Because it's a high temperature, it's melting fast, you could run it through. As a matter of fact, let me, just, let me crank it up just a minute and show you that. So I've got it at a very high setting. Watch this. Did you see how fast that went? I mean, I and because I went fast, the, the cut is much finer and I didn't lose as much material. But the, 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 uh, what you're losing is control. When you run it through fast, sometimes uh, you end up with uh, not a perfectly straight cut because there might be some variation in how you're pushing. You also risk breaking the wire. Now, let's run this piece at one and seven eighths, I said. Let's double check that. Yeah, one and seven eighths. I'm gonna crank the temperature down a little bit and I'm gonna go through at a slow speed because you can't go through high, uh, you can't go through it high, and I'm just gonna, even at a very slow speed, that low temperature makes such a fine line. I lost almost no material here. Compare that, well, I, I used the original piece, but com compare that cut to the earlier one that I used with a high, high temperature. The reason I'm sharing this with you is if you need accuracy, if you need to try not to lose a lot of melted foam, go with a slower temperature, a lower temperature, and a slower feed speed. If accuracy is not that, is not super necessary, let's just say you're cutting a one-off piece, you can crank the temperature up a little bit and push it through. You might lose a little bit of material, but you'll get the job done quicker. How much quicker? I mean, we're talking seconds here, right? But if you're working on a very large project, sometimes you you want to get your cutting going. You need to get things done. So moving the temperature low to uh, high will give you different results. Now let me show you this. Sometimes you want to just etch a line on your foam. So let me show you what it looks like with a high temperature. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on and I'm just going to pull the foam into the wire and then back out and you'll see a line. This is high temperature. Let the wire heat up. I can actually see how red it is. Now I want you to notice, look how thick that, the, now you can really see the melting. I mean, this wire is very thin, but look how much material it melted away just from just touching it. Now let's compare that to a low temperature. think you know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> Look at that. Look at the difference. So if you're wanting to cut a groove, say, into stone um, to give a, a brick pattern, this might be what you're going for. You want a nice deep groove uh, with gaps between the two stones, or you may not. You may want just a very sharp line. The difference is the sharp line like this, you can always widen it later visually with something like a pen just by running a pin down it, you can widen that line a little bit, and if you do keep going, you can you can widen it some more. Eventually, you'll need something a little bit wider to widen this line. But as you can see, it still maintains a very sharp, sharp line. Hot temperature, cool temperature, and again, at the lower temperature, you don't you don't even have to pull it away fast. You can take your time and just put it on there and pull it away, and you still get that very sharp line there. 
Now you understand temperature. You can increase the temperature to run something through faster and to uh, create larger, larger gaps. Or you can lower the temperature to, cr to create a more fine line, lose less material to uh, melting, but you have to feed at a slower rate. Each month, Bexham's Bazaar RPG and Wargaming Magazine provides gamers with articles, props to print and cut out for players, mini adventures, new monsters, and much more. Look in the description below for details on how to get a few free issues so you can see what you're missing. All right, when it comes to cutting foam, you can use the grid on the actual Proxon itself. Remember, these are uh, one centimeter squares. And if you're using metric, you'll need a metric ruler. I don't have a metric ruler. I just use my standard inch here. So you can, you can move the fence so that, the, that this side of the fence is on one of the lines. So if I want to cut something 4 centimeters or 40 millimeters, I'm, I've lined it up on the 40 here, right there on the 40. Um, you'll need to make sure that the fence follows the line. All right. Now remember, it's measuring from here to this black line, which is where the wire is supposed to, to enter. And it does. The, the hole is right there on this black line. And I'm assuming that your, your wire is at 90 degrees um, perpendicular to the tabletop here. So if I run this through, and you take your material, and remember, you need a square. This needs to be flat. If it's uneven, which I'll show you what happens in a minute, you're going to get an uneven cut. But if this is flat, and I know it is, as long as I keep it against the fence, and I push this through, and I'm having to go slow because this is a thick piece of foam, and I forgot to set my temperature a little higher. And I'm feeling resistance by the wire, okay? So this is a 40 centimeter wide piece. I can run it through here and it's it's a very tight fit. All right. Now another method you can use is just a ruler. You put the ruler with, let's say I want to cut a one inch piece, I put the one inch mark on the wire, make sure the ruler is square and I'm looking on the inside here, make sure the ruler is square and then push the push the fence up against the the edge of the ruler and tighten it down. All right, so now I've set the one inch gap here. Now remember, if this is set to high heat, when I cut, I'm going to end up with a little less than one inch wide piece. But if I set it to a low temperature, and I'm going to go slow. I'm going very slow. I mean, if I go too much, much faster, it's going to break that wire because this wire is under tension. All right, there we go. So I can look at this. And I've got a one, I mean, look at the accuracy of that. Pretty good, all right, one inch. Let's run it through at a high temperature and see what we get. I've cranked it up all the way, and I'm gonna run it through at a moderate speed. Now, I probably didn't lose too much there, but I did. Can, let's see, can you see there is a, just a fraction less, right there is about your best view. There is a fraction, just a tiny, tiny amount, less than one inch, and that's due to the melting. So, and let's see, can I put these up against one another? <laughs> let's see if you can see. Uh, you're probably not going to be able to, but you're going to have to trust me that this edge is just a, just a tiny amount. This is the shorter one that, that used high heat. This is low heat, and there is just a very small overhang right here. Uh, where it's, uh, it's the original one inch versus the melted piece. All right, finally, another way to, uh, to um, do cuts to a certain uh, measurement is if you have something that is a thir certain thickness. Like, watch this, I'm not even, I'm not gonna measure. I'm just, I'm just gonna cut this piece, I'm moving the, this randomly and I'm gonna lock it down and I'm gonna run this piece through at medium temperature. All right. Now, I don't know what thickness this is. I could measure it right now, but I'm not going to. But let's say I need another piece cut to this thickness. Well, let's say you've made some cuts and you come back and you go, oh, I need to cut another piece that's just this thick. Well, what you can do is you can put this flat against the fence like this, push it until it touches the wire, and you don't want to bend the wire. Make sure the wire is not moving. Just move it until it's just touching the wire, tighten it down, 
and then run a piece through and <laughs> uh, you, you just have to trust me again but that is that's flush they are the same thickness uh, now one one technique that you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make this mistake because I do it all the time when you're cutting you're always going to be keeping the piece that's up against the fence, not the other one. I have made the mistake sometimes. Like, let's say I want to, this piece is, you know, a certain thickness. And let's say I've measured it and I want to cut it in half. So I run it through. I'm going to quickly do this. One. So I run it through, and I, now I have two pieces, right? I've made the mistake of keeping this one, not this one, and now I this one might not be the exact same thickness as the one I intended to keep. So always remember when you're cutting to pull away the piece on the right and set it down and know that the piece that's left over here is the piece that you need to be using. All right, um, You're laughing at me right now saying, well, that's, that's common sense, but trust me, uh, it happens. Now normally when you are making cuts on foam, you want to have a nice smooth edge that can stay uh, matching with the fence. But sometimes you don't have that. Now what you can do is you can always use a straight edge and a blade, right? Straight edge and a blade to cut a straight edge that you can then use on here. But sometimes you don't need that level of accuracy. You just need something close enough that that it's not going to run uh, run odd on the thing. Let me let me show you something real quick. Let me run this through, and I'm wiggling it. All right. So <laughs> you'll notice this is not a straight edge right here. So what happens is when you run this uh, through, uh, it's it's going to hit certain bumps, and you're going to end up with a cut that is not straight. Okay, uh, it may look straight, but trust me, it's not. So how do you get around that? Well, obviously, like I said, you can cut a straight edge with a blade, and then have have something to go go across. Or what you can do is you can do what I do here. Um, let me show you. All right, you'll see this bump right there in the middle. That's going to cause this to not sit flat. It doesn't. I can I can put it this way and run it through, or I can tip it this way and run it through. But it's like a it's like a tipping point, right? I can't decide. So what do I do in that situation? Well, I eyeball it. What I do is I put the point against the fence, and you you want to shave off enough to give yourself a straight edge. So what I do is I move the fence as close as I can to the wire that will still allow me to take off enough. And then what I do is I run it through at a high, at a medium speed, not high, and I'm watching and I'm holding this piece and keeping, keeping the point on the fence and trying not to rock it this way. It's a bit, you know, you get practice, you'll get practice doing it, and then what you'll eventually end up with is you just go slow and try not to let it vary, and then you end up with a straight edge or close enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough that enough points, enough of the high spots are on the fence that when I run it through now, there's no variability. I end up with a very smooth cut. Okay, so that's one way to do it. You could go crazy, and I don't recommend this. I did this years ago when I first got my Proxon. I created this and I 3D printed it. You'll notice it's got these little spikes right here. They're sharp points. Let's see if I can show you. Yeah, they're, they're sharp points. This trough right here is designed to sit on the fence and slide. So let's say, let's say this one. So I line it up on the line, and then I slide it over and I press down, all right? And now I can just slide it through and I get a straight cut. And when I take this off, you'll see there's two points that where the, the these uh, sharp points dug in to hold it. This is a little extreme. I made this because I couldn't really, I wasn't good at looking down. Like, see this angle right here? I, I just, I'm just going to keep this point on the fence. I'll lock it down and I'm going to slide it through and I'm trying to keep keep it from warping 
and I ended up cutting it off and providing myself with a straight edge. You'll get good at this. You'll get good at just taking off a rough edge quickly just by holding it and then moving it through to give yourself a more accurate flat edge. This will come in time as you get better, as you get practice and just better acquainted with your Proxon. One of the great things about the Proxon is it's great for making perfect square foam pieces. You probably will have figured this out if you've done any practice or, or if you have a new Proxon and you're playing with it, you've probably figured this out. But if you want to make a perfect, say, one inch square piece of foam, it's real simple. Uh, you set your wire to one inch using a ruler, right? Or you could say 20 centimeters or whatever. And then what you do is you run it through once, take your piece, turn it 90 degrees, run it through again, and now you've got a perfect square piece. Again, I know this is common sense for a lot of people, but for people who just bought a Proxon, uh, this is one of the greatest ways to create a, a perfectly square piece of foam. And then let's say you want to chop this into uh, equal, equal uh, tiles. Set your, set your fence to you know, a certain thickness, and then you just start running it through. Run, and, and try to be consistent with your speed. Don't speed up or slow down because, again, that can vary the thickness of your slices. All right, so now I have a bunch of perfect square tiles that can be used uh, for a lot of different things, and you'll do that. You'll do that uh, for the same for bricks. If you if you don't want square, you want uh, rectangular. Just get the rectangular ones you want, and then set your thickness and just run it through, and you'll create a bunch of bricks this uh, with the dimensions that you need. All right, the next thing I want to show you is how to do beveled cuts. Beveled cuts are really interesting because they they can cut an angle off of a piece so that you don't end up with 90 degree blocks all the time. You could take a nice soft edge off or you could go extreme or you know, more extreme. Now, bevel cuts are, are great to do, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do them. And this took some time for me to figure out. Actually, it only took a couple mistakes, but it took me a while to figure out the solution for it. Now, here I've got a protractor. You can use it by placing it behind the wire and you, you will loosen this up, loosen the, the top, and the side so that you can move this forward and back like so. And as you move this back, you can visually look at the wire and see where I want to go to a 45 degrees. Well, I need to get down here and look at it. And 45 degrees is right about there. Now, what you cannot see, when the wire gets too far back, it actually hits the edge of this little gold piece right here, copper piece, and it bends the wire. So you're not really getting necessarily a true 45 degrees. You're changing your measurement point. So my point is this, because the wire bends, I'm measuring from this solid black line, but you actually have to shift it back and measure from where the wire touches this little copper point because that's actually where the wire is now bending instead of inside. It's a little little uh, tricky at first. You'll get the hang of it once you actually do this yourself, but get one of these, it's handy. So if I put this right here, I'll find that, now this says it's a 40 degree cut, but if I shift it over, it's actually a 42 degree cut. Just that two little millimeter of movement changed it by almost a degree. So there is a, when, when the wire is not touching the copper piece, you can use this from the black line to get an accurate angle. But once that wire hits or touches the copper piece, you have to shift this with your middle point line to where the wire touches the copper. Just keep that in mind, and knowing that, let's learn how to make bevel cuts. Okay, I have set the wire at an angle of, 60 degrees. 
You're just going to have to trust me on this. And it's with the wires touching the copper. All right, so I'm measuring from that point, and it's right at the 60 degree mark. So what that means is, if I run this through, I can create a 60 degree cut from this lower point where my finger is right there up to some point. Let's do this. So what you do is you line your fence to where the edge, the, the, the right side of your piece, is on this solid black line. All right, Line it up. And then this is the tricky part of bevel cutting. You're just going to have to learn where to keep your fingers and how to feed it. What I typically do is if, if, if your finger is too high, it's going to touch the wire. So what I do is I put pressure on the fence by holding my hand on it. I put one finger at the bottom down here or close to it, my thumb up at the top, and I just sort of slide it through like so. And this is a 60 degree angle right there. Now here is, here's the problem. Melting. Now remember, medium to hot temperature, it's going to melt a certain percentage of, uh, a certain small amount of the corner here off, right? So if this, if this piece is 7 eighths, can you see that? 7 eighths and I run it through here. I shouldn't have adjusted it. There we go. If I run it through here, you want it right on the black line. Okay, there we go. Well, let me, let me see if I can explain it. If you look, there's two things you've got to be careful of here. One, when the wire touches the foam, I've got it turned off right now. When it touches the foam, it's not actually touching the corner here. It's actually just about about a millimeter or so back. And if you don't believe me, let me run it through and I'll show you. Can you see the cut? See how it did not match up to the edge? Again, that had to do with because I've got my wire on the copper piece, I'm not taking that into consideration. So now, if I if I adjust my if I adjust my fence so that the back here is lined up with where the wire actually, what I can do is I can place my uh, straight edge on the wire right here, okay, and create a new black instead of this black line. I'm going to use my straight edge here, and I'm running the the I'm I'm squaring it by taking my ruler and running it along one of these lines to keep it straight. And it's right there. Then what I can do is I can run this up, pinch the piece in there, remove my ruler. Now watch. It goes right to the edge. Can you see that? Let's see if you can see if it focuses. <laughs> Sorry about the focusing, but yeah, it meets it right there. So that is one part of understanding beveled edges. You, if you want it to come right to the to the edge, you're going to have to adjust where your fence is because your wire is now up against the copper piece. It's not free floating inside the circle. That's just one problem with bevel cutting. Let me show you the other problem. Now remember. When it reaches the end down here, it's melting just a little bit off of this off of this size. So we know we know that this is seven eighths. All right, seven eighths. So let's uh, let's cut it up. Let's uh, if here's what happens if you do not uh, if you do not make this adjustment. All right, based on the wires position. If you use this black line, let me show you what happens. So I'm moving it back to the black line and I'm going to cut. I'm going to bevel one side. Now let's say I want to bevel the other side. Now this should be 7 eighths, but watch what happens when I flip it around and I run it through again. Look, look at the gap right there. There's a gap. It's not here. It's, it's here. So if I run this through, 
it's not going to be the correct, uh, it's going to look a little wonky. So to adjust that, what you got to do is you bring it up to the black line, tighten it down, and run it through. But some of you are probably going, yeah, but I see a problem. Yes, there is a problem. Now, this bottom piece down here, which should be seven eighths, seven eighths, it's now three quarters, six eighths. Actually, a little, little shy of that. Because I'm removing material from the bottom on both sides, I've shortened this piece. Now, it looks nice, but it's not the width that I need. So, knowing that, what's the solution? Let me show you. All right, let's assume that I want to make a pyramid. All right, and I want that pyramid to have a one inch base. All right, so I set the fence to one inch. I'm going to run this piece through at a higher temperature. Well, no, let's go medium. I want it to be close to one inch. I'm having to go a little slower feed so that I don't uh, snap the wire. All right, so here I have a one inch square piece, close, a little less than one inch, but close enough. And I want this to remain the same for my pyramid. Okay, I want all four sides to be beveled. So if you'll remember, I just showed you that if you use this black line to, uh, to go all the way down to the edges, this is actually going to lose width. It's going to come in, um, and you don't want that. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to make your beveled cuts not to the bottom, but to a point higher. And then when you get your pyramid, you'll trim off the bottom so that you end up with uh, the base that you still want. So to do this, let me, uh, let me set this back. I'm just going to eyeball this. I want to make a bevel cut right about here. All right. So if I run this, if I put this on the black line and I run it through, because it's not touching the copper piece, so it's a true angle. I can measure that angle. So if I run it to the bottom angle and I, and I keep rotating this and running it through and, and, and cutting the bevel edge, this bottom base is going to shrink. There's going to be, uh, there's, it's going to shrink because I'm taking material off of the bottom from heat, right? So what I can do here is I can cheat a little bit. Instead of starting on the black line, what I'll do is I'll back it up about, say, a centimeter. And I can use the centimeter line on here. Now, I run it through four times. Actually, I'm going to cut this piece down a little bit. It's a little too tall. All right. So... Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this through four times, beveling each side. So here goes the first one. One. Rotate it 90 degrees. Run it through again. Two. 90 degrees. Rotate it again. Or run it through again. Three. Rotate it the final 90 degrees. Run it through again. And now I end up with an, a, a very sharp uh, point, right? But it's not, it's not a pyramid because I've got this extra bit here. All I've got to do is line it up and then run it through. You end up with a base that is still... All right at it. I didn't take any off. It's, it's right at about an inch almost, a little less. But you end up with this a perfectly beveled pyramid that the base is still the dimensions you want. Now, why is this important? Why would you care that the base shrunk a little bit? You know, so what? The base shrunk a little bit. Why, why does that matter? Well, let's assume that you're making a column of some sort. And this is going to be glued onto a one inch by one inch base. Well, as you can see, it fits perfectly. It's square. But if this were, if this base were just a hair thinner and I glued it on here, there would be a little edge all the way around, a little flat edge, because it doesn't meet up perfectly. Now, granted, I didn't have to cut this off. I could have, I could have cut it off, you know, here and had a little extra bit that would have been perfectly one inch by one inch. But there's different reasons you would want to do this. But one of the things about beveled cuts is a lot of times. You want to bevel cut a certain piece and then match it to another piece. 
And that is why you do not want to have your original base size altered. So that's why I raised or I increased the, uh, the distance from the black line to one centimeter so that I did not take that beveled cut all the way to the bottom. I took it up to a certain point and then I chopped it off. And that is the way you can make perfect beveled cuts. Okay, the last thing I want to show you on this is let's say you don't want to use you know, a, comp a compass protractor to do an angled cut. Let's say you want, you know that you want to do a 30 degree cut or a 45 degree cut, not, not a, something in between. All right, one way you can do this is you take the, um, take the fence or the uh, fence and this, this rail hold, the piece that holds the fence out and put it along the vertical edge over here. All right, see how it slides this way? All right, so line it up, uh, tighten, tighten, the, uh, tighten this to a point, but you'll notice you have degrees over here. So loosen, loosen this piece that makes an angle, okay, like this, and then loosen this just enough so it slides and you can move this. Now let's say I want to make a 30 degree cut. So what I do is I line, I take this up and I adjust, adjust it so that it's right on the line and then I tighten the angle down not not the slider tighten the angle down alright now this can only move in this direction alright now I haven't found a better way to do this but it's gonna require a little bit of uh, painters tape let's say you wanna make a perfect you know 30 degree cut in foam alright so and let's say you want it to start at the edge so what you do is set it on the fence move it up to where the wire touches that edge and then take some painters tape and just when you get it right where you want it just tape it down tape it down and you only need to tape it in one place because you can hold it with your finger um, the other thing is see how this slides this is one of the things i don't like about the proxon this thing is not really locked it slides so what you want to do is you're going to hold See, there's a, there's a slight raised area right here. Put your thumb there and hold this. Line it up visually so you can see. Pull it down, turn it on. Get ready to turn it off when the wire hits the fence. So you push it through. It touches the fence and I turned it off. Pull this off and uh, I can ver visually verify that yes, that is a 30 degree cut from, from the flat side. So. I'm sure there are other methods for doing that, but whenever I need to make a 30, 45, 60 degree cut, I'll often use this method if, if there's enough material that I can tape. Sometimes you're doing a very small piece and it's going to be very hard to tape it in such a way that the wire can actually make the cut. So you'll have to do, do this based on what you need, but that's an easy way to cut a set degree on a larger piece that you can secure it to the fence with some tape and then free your hand up to guide guide it through so the fence doesn't move okay so there you go that's some just some basic techniques for the proxon it is certainly not comprehensive there are probably things i have forgotten there are probably things that you are wondering about that uh, i can't know unless you ask me so definitely if you have any questions about the proxon post them in the comments below and i'll do my best to answer them. And if there are enough questions uh, about some other uh, uses of the Proxon, I may do a follow-up video to this one. But ultimately my goal here was just to give Mark, uh, who said in his email that he had just got a Proxon and he was kind of nervous about using it. My purpose here was just to give you uh, some basics uh, for making cuts, making nice bevel cuts, which is one of my favorite uses for the Proxon, by the way. Um, I hope this was helpful to you. If it was, please consider giving the video a thumbs up. If it wasn't, give it a thumbs down. That's fine too. Uh, please do hit the subscribe button uh, so you'll be notified of future videos. Uh, I invite you to come over and join us at the Tabletop Crafters Guild. I am one of the six guild masters over there and we try to make it a fun place, safe place for people to ask questions, to post their own crafts and get feedback and just a, a nice place to, to hang with people who share in our crafting hobby. You are also totally invited to come join my own Facebook page, the Tabletop Engineer Facebook page, where pretty much do the same thing, but um, I post things there 
that are more specific to the things I do that might not necessarily always fit over at the Tabletop Crafters Guild. And then finally, I totally would love to have you as a patron of mine. For just a dollar a month, you're going to get access to early videos like this one, uh, usually three weeks to a month before I release them on YouTube for everyone else. You also will be invited to live crafting uh, sessions uh, at least once a week, but typically twice a week. I set aside an hour to an hour and a half for two sessions, three hours max. And I do live crafting where you patrons are invited to come. You can ask questions. I'll invite you up on the video screen if you want. We can chat face to face. But it's a totally, usually the projects are a little bigger in scope and they take a little longer. So I spread them out over uh, numerous videos, but patrons have access to that. I've also started doing a Sunday night miniature painting session where you come and join me on Zoom. Uh, we paint together and we talk and we laugh and it's a very fun time. So I totally uh, would love to have you as a patron and it's just a dollar a month and it helps me financially to keep doing these videos and this gaming content for the gaming community at large. And all the information you need to do is to do that is in the description below. All right, Mark, this one's for you. I hope this was helpful to you. And I, uh, if you were considering buying a Proxon, or if you have one and have just been sort of not sure quite how to push it uh, to its limits, not that I have in this video, uh, I hope this video was helpful to you. Okay, this is Jim, the Tabletop Engineer. I will see you in the next video. Take care.